Good morning. This is Eleanor with Audible Local Ledger. Today I'll be reading excerpts from the Providence Journal, dated Tuesday, September 10th, 2024. Our first headline is a passage. Feinstein dies at 93, known for charities. Philanthropist was a household name in Rhode Island. By Antonia Nouri Farzan. Alan Sean Feinstein, the ubiquitous figure whose name adorns buildings throughout Rhode Island, died this weekend at 93. Feinstein made his fortune by selling so-called collectibles like Marstemt stamps from Sierra Leone that he suggested would skyrocket in value. But he was better known as a prolific philanthropist who lived in a modest ranch house in Cranston right up until his death while giving away millions to schools and scholarship programs. For Rhode Islanders who grew up in the 90s and 2000s, Feinstein was a household name. He made regular visits to virtually every school in the state, handing out Guyanese baseball cards, and later coupons for free popcorn at the Feinstein IMAX Theater at the Providence Place Mall. Often clad in a gold jacket, he would encourage students to become Feinstein Junior Scholars, which involved pledging to do good deeds and documenting them in a Feinstein-branded journal. There's no yacht in the world that can match 250,000 children pledging to make the world a better place one good deed at a time, he told the Providence Journal in 21. How did Alan Sean Feinstein make his money? Feinstein was a true Rhode Island character, despite growing up in Dorchester, Massachusetts, and attending Boston University. He first moved here with his wife, Pratarnporn Feinstein, who was completing her residency in child psychiatry. The couple also spent time in Pratarnporn's homeland of Thailand, and Feinstein later said that a private meeting with the king of Thailand inspired him to help children. Feinstein made his millions from publishing newsletters with titles like International Insider's Report and The Wealth Maker, which were sent to mailing lists that he purchased from a broker, he told the journal in 2004. He also wrote and sold various get-rich-quick titles like Making Your Money Grow and How to Make Money Fast. Through direct mail solicitations, Feinstein advertised commemorative items like stamps, collectible coins, and presidential autographs. Among them, a set of stamps issued by Sierra Leone depicting a Martian rock formation that resembled a human face. Feinstein never promised that the stamps' value would balloon, but he quoted a respected scientific researcher who suggested that the $135 set could be worth 10000 or more once intelligent life was discovered on Mars. A Beanie Baby-style rush broke out, the journal reported, but collectors never saw the return on their investment that they'd anticipated. Today, a set of stamps cost $15 on eBay. A ubiquitous name in Rhode Island schools. In 1991, around the time of the Mars promotion, Feinstein formed his first charity, the Feinstein Foundation. Within a few years, he had put in about $50 million of his own money, he told the journal. He started yet another nonprofit, the Alan Sean Feinstein Foundation, after retiring from the newsletter business in 1996. Before long, his name appeared on Alan Sean Feinstein Elementary School in Providence, Alan Sean Feinstein Middle School in Coventry, University of Rhode Island, Alan Sean Feinstein College of Continuing Education, Alan Sean Feinstein Graduate School at Johnson and Wales University, the Feinstein College of Arts and Sciences at Robert Roger Williams University, just to name a few. In 2000, Feinstein paid $1.4 million for the naming rights to the Providence Place Mall's IMAX Theater. The deal required his name to be the same size as the IMAX logo and linked to all promotions and ticket sales. But a different company later purchased the theater and removed his name prompting Feinstein to file a federal lawsuit. Critics often contended contended that Feinstein's generosity came with strings attached, namely his insistence on being prominently recognized. In 2008, he withdrew an offer to donate a million dollars to Westerly Middle School 
when some community members chafed at the condition that the school be renamed after him. I can't understand why the focus would be on, why does this guy have to have his name on everything, Feinstein told the journal at the time, adding, 95% of what I give, my name isn't on. Charitable legacy will live on. The flood of tributes that poured in after his death was announced on Monday suggests that the Cranston resident will be remembered for his philanthropy, not the controversies that sometimes dogged him. And the Feinstein Foundation will live on. Feinstein told the Journal in 21 that he expected his daughter, Leela Feinstein, to succeed him at its head. A funeral service for Feinstein's family and friends will take place on September 21st at Swan Point Cemetery, his obituary states. It will also be live-streamed on Zoom. Next headline. A big old-school block party vibe. PVD Fest is much better after return to downtown by Antonia Nuri Farzan. It may not have been the same freewheeling, somewhat lawless event that it was in the early years, but this year's PVD Fest was considerably more dynamic and fun than last year's disappointing flop, according to attendees. Compared to last year, the flow of people and the energy is much better, said James Fallon of Stolen Two Media, who is selling his mixed-media collage art on Washington Street, where a group of toddlers were, leaning, were learning to break dance in the shadow of City Hall. The key difference? Moving the event back downtown. It's just more of, a, of the big old-school block party vibe, Fallon said. Chaotic weather, confusing layout hurt last year's festival. Under the administration of former mayor Jorge Elorza, PVD Fest was a giant three-day party that took over downtown Providence in June and felt like the city's unofficial kickoff to summer. But after Mayor Brett Smiley took office last year, he imposed a slew of unpopular changes, including prohibiting open containers, banning most block parties, moving the festival to a new location along the Providence River, and changing the date to September. Last year's festival was widely perceived to be a bust. Jonathan Kirk, owner of Massa Tech Taqueria, summed up the mood when he described it as a shell of what it used to be. Food trucks and vendors were on one side of the river, while music and entertainment was on another, leading to less foot traffic and depressed sales. Honestly, this year has been everything I could have asked for. Sky Tanner, PVD Fest vendor who sells candy-colored jewelry and designs, and stickers with nostalgic designs. After facing widespread criticism for ruining the popular festival, Smiley's administration compensated vendors who lost money and reversed some of the changes this year. There were still limits on block parties, and you couldn't freely wander around with a drink in hand, but PVD Fest once again took over the city's downtown. This one so far seems very well organized, Vicky Olivo, who works for Thrive Cakery, said on Saturday. As a vendor myself, it's been pretty steady, so it's wonderful, I would say. Last year's PVD Fest was a disaster for Sky Tanner of iSky, who sells candy-colored jewelry and stickers with nostalgic designs from the 2000s. Tanner was stuck in a parking garage, literally watching my stuff wash down the river, when the squall tore through the festival. They lost a pop-up tent and a decent amount of merchandise to the storm and considered not even reopening the wound and returning to PVD Fest this year. But the weekend delivered ideal weather, not too hot to stand on a shadeless city sidewalk and dance as the extraordinary rendition band paraded by, but not too cold to purchase a scoop of Big Feeling ice cream or a Dell's. The rain held off until about 9 p.m. Saturday night, an hour after the, fish, the festival had officially ended. Honestly, this year has been everything I could have asked for, Tanner said on Saturday afternoon. There's been a great turnout. Everyone has been super friendly. It's just been a great vibe. Tanner credited House of Kodak, which organizes LGBTQ plus art markets, for partnering, partnering with PVD Fest to make space at Burnside Park available to vendors at low cost. That allowed smaller businesses and creators to have the opportunity to participate, they said. Bringing life back to downtown. 
This year's PVD Fest was compressed into a tighter time frame, Friday night and all day Saturday, in order to leave Sunday open as a rain date. Attendance numbers weren't immediately available, but one of the biggest draws <clears throat> excuse me, appears to be Italian aerialist Eventi Verticale, who performed while suspended by a 60-foot crane above Kennedy Plaza. I did PVD Fest last year, and it's definitely a different vibe, said Hannah Hallett of Canvas Elevation, who is selling foil-printed stickers and prints with tarot and astrology designs, and said it was exciting to see the community come together downtown. It's really nice to see Providence activated in such a collaborative way, she said. Next up, Two Friends Love of Rhode Island Seafood Spawns Fest, Antonia Nori Farzan. T.J. McNulty is from New York and manages a construction company, company's office in Los Angeles. Adrian Crawford is a native of Australia and does marketing for a cannabis oil or CBD company in Denver. But they both love Rhode Island seafood so much that they take time off from their day jobs every September and fly to Providence to put on the Rhode Island Seafood Festival, which marked its 14th year in India Point Park this past weekend. As Crawford put it, we come out here once a year, throw a party, and go home. They've amassed a dedicated fan base, including one Canadian woman who enthusiastically followed their Facebook page for 12 years before finally flying out to Rhode Island this weekend to experience the festival for herself. This year, Crawford estimated roughly 10 to 12,000 people sampled some of the state's finest seafood. Rhode Island has the best seafood in the country, hands down, Crawford said, and what better way to showcase than to bring all the best restaurants in New England together. Among the offerings, lobster bayo and lobster banh mi from 505 Fusion, lobster crostini from Scotty's Salumeria, and oysters from five local farms. Sunset Farms maple bacon scallop skewers sold out on Sunday afternoon while guests dance to energetic rock bands and sip drinks from pineapples. It's our biggest event of the whole year, said Dave Roebuck, who owns Salt Pond Oysters and operates the Shuck and Truck. Typically, he said, they'll go through about 7,000 oysters and 1,000 Little Necks at the festival. Festival has grown up since its disastrous first year. McNulty, who was one of the event's original founders, first came to Providence to attend Johnson & Wales University, where he majored in business. After he graduated, he traveled all over the country for work, but always made a point of returning to Providence. Rhode Island is just a very special place, he said. One of those visits took place shortly after the state finished moving Interstate 195, which helped him realize that India Point Park would be the perfect place for a seafood festival. The first year was an utter disaster, said McNulty, who organized the 2011 event with two friends who are no longer involved in its production. They were all young and inexperienced, McNulty acknowledged, and it was rough. The Providence Journal, in an article titled Crowd Left Clamoring for Chowder, reported that the organizers had exceeded their expected attendance numbers and sold hundreds of discounted tickets through Groupon, leading to long lines and irate customers. Crawford, who had befriended McNulty at a wedding in 2010, got involved later on after McNulty retooled the event. In those early years, the festival didn't even charge admission and felt kind of just like a party for our buddies, Crawford recalled. Tickets now cost $15. Eventually, it evolved and matured, as we did, he said. We love throwing a party for Providence. McNulty said that guests now routinely tell him that the Rhode Island Seafood Festival is the best organized festival they've ever attended. Among the keys to its success, making sure that there's plenty of diversity among vendors and their menus so there aren't 10 different food trucks serving lobster rolls. It's one of my favorite festivals of the year, said Ethan Farrell, who runs Sunset Farm with his father, Jeff. This year, ongoing construction forced the event to move to a different part of India Point Park, but being in a larger space actually seems to have encouraged guests to linger longer, said McNulty, who acknowledged that he was nervous about the change. 
I like the bigger venue, Farrell said. Hopefully it stays here. The event has no shortage of competitors, including the Charlestown Seafood Festival, the Ocean State Oyster Festival, and the Newport Oyster and Chowder Festival. So why should people put the Rhode Island Seafood Festival on their calendar for the first weekend after Labor Day? We don't do it to make money, Crawford said. We love throwing a party for Providence. The organizers may not be from here, he noted, but we also are not here to take advantage of the locals. I've never lived in Providence, but I love this city with all my heart, Crawford said. I lived in Maine, and the lobster there is great, but the seafood here, hands down, is better than anywhere, and people come out for it. Again, you're listening to Audible Local Ledger for Tuesday, September 10th, excerpt from the Providence Journal. Our next headline, Grants Available for Some with Bridge Closing Losses, by Patrick Anderson. Small businesses who lost customers when the westbound Washington Bridge closed last winter will be able to apply for a modicum of relief starting Tuesday. Rhode Island set aside $2.6 million of its remaining federal pandemic aid to help businesses affected by the bridge closure and is now ready to begin awarding the money, Governor Dan McKee announced on Monday. To be eligible, businesses, including nonprofits and sole proprietorships, will have to be able to show at least a $500 decline in revenue from last December to February compared with the same period in 2022 to 23. They also can have no more than $2 million in annual revenue, so national gambling company Bally's, which has attributed losses to the bridge, will not be able to participate. The largest grants will be $2,500 and go to the businesses that lost the most money, with the smaller grants of 1500 also set to be awarded, according to a news release from the Rhode Island Commerce Corporation Monday. Of the total grant pool, $1.2 million in grants will go to businesses in East Providence and be chosen by East Providence Mayor Bob DeSilva's administration. Providence Mayor Brett Smiley will get to award $800,000 in grants to Providence businesses. <clears throat> and the Rhode Island Commish Commerce Corporation has set aside $600,000 to give to businesses in non-Providence or East Providence cities in the state who also suffered documentable revenue losses. This winter was tough for businesses that rely on the Washington Bridge, and even though we were able to get six lanes moving again pretty quickly and traffic volume is back to where it was, Businesses still need help to offset some of the losses they experienced this winter, McKee said in a news release. McKee this spring proposed spending $1.3 million from Rhode Island's Federal American Rescue Plan Fund for bridge assistance grants, and lawmakers doubled that total to $2.6 million in the state budget they passed in June. Businesses will be able to find links to grant applications at commerceri.com slash WB Grants, starting at 2 p.m. on Tuesday. Advocates Issue Warning on Providence School Bus Woes by Tom Mooney A catastrophic school bus failure in Providence that left children with disabilities stranded in getting to and home from school last week must be resolved expeditiously or the matter could lead to litigation. So warned the American Civil Liberties Union of Rhode Island and the Center for Justice on Monday in a letter to the state education department officials. During the first week of school, Dotco Motor Coach, the private contractor hired by the State Department of Education, failed to cover numerous routes and left many students with disabilities waiting for hours at bus stops or denied transportation home, the letter said. Parents who contacted the ACLU described, described getting calls late in the afternoon that they would need to pick up their child due to the lack of bus service. In their letter, the ACLU and Center for Justice noted that for students with medical needs, lengthy delays in busing can adversely affect their health. Ride officials, who oversee the city schools, condemned the company's performance last week and sent a letter to DATCO on Friday demanding that the problems be fixed within 10 days. But in their letter to Ride Commissioner Angelica Infante-Green Infante and Chief Legal Counsel Anthony Catone, the ACLU and Center for Justice said, 
Ride does not have 10 days to fix this problem. It needs to fix it now. They called for education officials to take immediate steps, including asking Governor Dan McKee to issue an executive order allowing DATCO to temporarily operate buses with driver's license in other states. They also urged that RIDE post on a website each evening the status of bus routes for the upcoming day, provide a phone line for parents to call to troubleshoot and resolve transportation problems, and provide reimbursement for parents forced to drive their children to school or to hire car services to get them there on time. In a statement Monday, ACLU cooperating attorney Ellen Sederman said, It is outrageous that Ride did not make sure that every bus route was fully staffed prior to the first day of school and has left parents to fend for themselves without any support and with little, if any, information. This problem needs to be corrected immediately, not in 10 days. Next up, the advice column. Ask Carolyn. Dying father begs daughter to reconcile with her abusive twin. Adapted from an online discussion. Dear Carolyn, my father is ill and wants me to reconcile with my twin sister, who is mentally, physically, and financially abusive to me, to the point of my cutting her entirely out of my life a couple of years ago. He insists we repair our relationship, which I view as irreparable, given her boundary issues and continued abuses. I won't do it. But he keeps using the I'll be dead soon card, claiming all he wants is his girls to be best friends. He invites her over when I visit, knowing it's a no-no, and he too cares little for my boundaries. I want to see my dad, but this old trope of dying father's wishes is tired and draining, Any advice on what I can say or do or not do that might get through to him? He's not big on insight. Twin. Dear Twin, you know what he is big on? You'll recognize it from all your complaints about your twin sister. Not just boundary issues, which you noted up and out the wazoo. There's also manipulation like you only read about. I'll be dead soon sounds like a punchline, yet he's apparently serious. He insists on something that is not his to insist on, your relationship with anyone, not even a sibling. He ambushes you with your sister's presence, which is breathtaking in its disrespect. I'm guessing your sister got her entire abuse and manipulation playbook from Daddy, with sections underlined for her. Your belief there's some way to get through to your dad, like it's your responsibility to say things exactly the right way to to achieve his respect, is from a different playbook, the one from someone on the receiving end of a lifetime of manipulation. Please throw that book away, or better, burn it, and scatter the ashes on the sea. Use these four words as your playbook instead. Never negotiate with terrorists. So, bullet number one. When he insists you repair your relationship, it's my relationship with someone else. You don't get to insist. Said once, then never dignified again with a response. Bullet number two. When he keeps using the I'll be dead soon card, I hear how hard this is for you. Then crickets. No further explaining or defending and no apologizing. Do not engage with him or the sister question. On the sister question. Bullet number three, he invites her over when you visit knowing it's a no-no. Leave the moment you see her there. That's the Chicago way. Regarding the dying father, you know it's okay to get mad at your dying father and show him that anger over his unwillingness to allow you to determine your own relationships with other people, right? A response from Anonymous, especially at the ambushes, because damn, thank you for underscoring this. Becoming seriously and even terminally ill does not good wash a person. If we do things intentionally to harm others, we're still responsible for them. Now, dear Abby, girlfriend rejects proposal offered with one big catch. Dear Abby, my boyfriend's mom has dementia. He asked me and my kids to move in with him and said he would marry me. In exchange, he expected me to quit my job and take care of his mom. I felt it was a disaster waiting to happen, and taking care of someone with dementia while raising two teenagers was a terrible idea, so I refused. 
He put his mother in a nursing home, and now I am no longer treated the same by him. The woman is abusive. She hits and bites and isn't easy to deal with. Living with her would have destroyed our relationship and been stressful for my children. My boyfriend isn't the easiest guy to open up to. I'm sad and don't know what to do. Signed, Too Much to Handle. Dear Too Much, When your boyfriend proposed marriage, it wasn't because he loved you. He was looking for an easy solution for him to his mother problem. To expect you to quit your job and sacrifice your retirement benefits was nervy. You are not trained to care for a violent dementia patient. He treats you differently because he's angry you didn't go along with his plans for you. What you should do now is move on because his resentment is unlikely to fit, to diminish. Dear Abby, for the entirety of our relationship, my wife has never listened to me. It's literally the only thing I've ever asked her to do. She constantly tells me I have nothing worthwhile to say without ever actually letting me finish a sentence. My mother is coming into some money and offered me a sizable sum, provided I don't tell my wife. I'm seriously considering taking the money and running. I can no longer deal with the constant emotional abuse. My wife treats her children the same way, and it's disgusting to me. What should I do? Signed, Tempted in Canada. Dear Tempted, if things are as bad as you have described, talk to an attorney and legally declare your independence. After that's done, take your mother up on her generous offer. Next letter. Dear Abby, when I married in 1974, my mother had one of my wedding photos of me in my wedding dress and, uh, and holding my bouquet. It was lovely, and she had it made up into a large 36 by 26 inch portrait with a beautiful frame. It hung in my old bedroom until she passed away. I have had it in a closet in my house ever since. I've asked my daughter and son if they would like to have it, and they don't. I'm wondering if I should throw it away or leave it up to them when I'm gone. Because we have always had a loving relationship, I don't want either of them to feel bad about disposing of it. Signed, Picturing the Future. Response, Dear Picturing, You must be sentimental about that portrait or you wouldn't have kept it all these years. Because of that, I don't think you should toss it. After you are gone, your daughter or son may change their mind about having it. Let them decide when the time comes. This has been Eleanor with Audible Local Ledger, reading excerpts from the Providence Journal dated Tuesday, September 10th, 2024. Thanks for listening.